I'm Ashton Addison from Event Chain for Investment Pitch Media and FinTech News Network. And today on Blockchain Interviews, we have Ryan Taylor, the CEO of Dashcore Group. Ryan, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Well, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Can we kick off the interview by hearing a little bit of your explanation of what is Dash to someone who is familiar with Bitcoin, but they're not super technical? Sure. So Dash is a digital currency, uh, very similar to, to Bitcoin. In fact, um, uh, Dash is a fork of Bitcoin's code base. Um, however, it's uh, really focused on the payments use case. So being peer-to-peer -peer cash, uh, that means several things. It means a uh, high degree of scalability, mm -hmm. uh, low transaction fees, and probably most importantly is instant confirmation. Mm -hmm. um, if you're going to be using digital currency as cash, you need it to confirm quickly. And so transactions on Dash's network take between one to two seconds. That's about as fast as a credit card authorization. And so um, it really makes it useful for the point of sale. Mm -hmm. Wow. And I know that you have experience in the payments industry from even before uh, knowing about Bitcoin and you saw the value in Bitcoin early, but you also saw the limitations that are currently in Bitcoin. Now, what was it specifically about Dash that interested you um, of actually getting deeply involved into building the next payment system? Well, I, I think that um, there's a few uh usability aspects of bitcoin that um that have obvious limitations to them one is the transaction speed that we talked about already um, but beyond that i what initially attracted me to dash was the fact that it was being set up to be flexible um, mm -hmm. and there's a couple of prerequisites that i think you need to have as a decentralized project in order to be able to move forward effectively and innovate. Um, and the founder of Dash, Evan Duffield, had articulated a vision for how that could occur. Uh, and so in Dash, there's a, a couple of different ways that it's different in terms of the way it incentivizes behavior on the network. Um, one of those is it's the first coin that I saw that recognized that um, there's more than one activity that adds value to the network and should be incentivized. In the case of Bitcoin, 100% of the transaction fees and 100% of the new coins that are created um, through the protocol are distributed to miners or the computing network that actually secures the network. But beyond security, you also need other things like developers, you need mm -hmm. Uh, legal work performed, you need uh, business development, you need marketing, you need infrastructure that will host full copies of the blockchain, that will relay these messages around the network at very high speeds. All of those uh, other components are not incentivized within the protocol of, of Bitcoin. And this was really the first project I saw where there was an attempt to try to solve some of those things. Mm -hmm. So the way Dash solves them is it splits its block reward and transaction fees across multiple parties. Uh, the three main ones being uh, the miners, same as Bitcoin. Uh, another chunk goes towards the master nodes. These are special nodes on our network or servers on the network that keep full copies of the blockchain and, and uh, relay messages around and, and perform other services that are important. Um, and the last is what we call our proposal system. This is everything else. These are developers. These are teams locally mm -hmm. working on the ground towards adoption. And in, Bit in Dash's network, those are paid roles. Anyone mm -hmm. can put a proposal up to that system to receive funding, propose what it is they're going to do for the network and receive funding. And that's our, actually where Dash Core Group gets its funding from. Mm. Well, that's great. And I could definitely see, you know, incentives to a community uh, making it grow that much faster. And yeah, it seems with Bitcoin, a lot of people are just volunteering and working, you know, for the future of Bitcoin and the goodwill uh, uh, on, you know, the improvement protocols. But to have it coded into the blockchain uh, is something that is very unique. So that's really interesting. And well, I, I think it better it better aligns incentives too. When you think mm -hmm. about an organization like Blockstream that does provide a lot of the developers for Bitcoin, 
they don't necessarily have the best interest of the user in mind because they have their own solutions that they're trying to sell to the market and mm -hmm. have an incentive to keep capacity on Bitcoin's blockchain quite low. And so you can see that it can develop into outright conflicts of interest when um, you allow outside funding sources mm -hmm. to, to dictate the development path. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is new news, but I, I know that you know, you're know you excited to talk about it this week about how Dash Core Group has proposed some changes to Dash's economics uh, in terms of the you know the coins and how it functions, and can you talk about you know what are the changes that have been made and, and how has it improved the system? Well, uh, Dash has evolved its economics throughout time. Um, the most recent change, though, was all the way back in 2015 when the proposal system was added. Um, prior to that, it was the only incentivized roles were miners and master nodes. And that really opened up a whole new world to the network in terms of how it developed itself and, and uh, how it allocated the uh, rewards to people that were benefiting the network. Um, and it served us very, very well since that time. Uh, but we have noticed that there are some shortcomings in, in the way that that occurs. Um, there's also some complex economics with the master nodes um, because uh, in order to upgrade your node on the network to a master node, you need to prove ownership over a thousand dash. And so as people are spinning up master nodes, they're actually sequestering portions of the supply. And that creates some really uh, uh, long term effects on uh, Dash's ability to act as a store of value. It can cause the price to spike mm -hmm. very quickly or to, to um, drop off very quickly over, over long periods of time. And so uh, we've done some analysis around this. We've learned a lot about how uh, masternode owners or operators react to those incentives. And we think that we've come up with a solution that help smooth some of those effects out and mm -hmm. avoid some of the price uh, uh, spikes and drops. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, price spikes and drops are, are not desirable for users, right? Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily want to see high volatility in the, in the token price. Definitely. Dash was the first one to innovate with masternodes. And I think having the foresight to see how all of these dynamics would play out was almost impossible. I think at this point, we have enough data to know how those interactions take place. And we're proposing a small shift from in, in the reward structure from uh, miners towards master nodes. It's mm -hmm. only about 10% of the reward, a little bit less than 10% of the reward, actually. Mm -hmm. And it's going to take place over a long period of time, say uh, five and a half years, actually. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's a very subtle change. It's a gradual one. We don't want to make this change abruptly. Mm -hmm. But the effect that it will have is it will have a dampening effect on our volatility. Mm -hmm. And so it should have benefits to end users. It'll certainly benefit masternode operators who will um, be able to collect a higher portion of the reward. It actually has benefits in the short term to miners because they, it, you know, it's counterintuitive, but the way that the rewards are distributed will encourage the creation of more master nodes mm -hmm. that will um, uh, actually pull additional coins out of circulating supply and, and into collateralizing master nodes. Mm -hmm. And that'll have a positive impact on the price that mm -hmm. will more than offset uh, the reduced rewards to miners. And then it's, of course, beneficial to proposal owners, too, if, if it has a, a supporting effect on price, because mm -hmm. it will make the proposal system larger um, or the funding available through that larger in terms of its value. And so it, it, it really captures a lot of the value of some of the technologies that we've rolled out over the last few years that allow us to safely do this without mm -hmm. compromising the safety of the network. Mm -hmm. Um, and it has benefits to all participants in the network. And so uh, it's really complicated stuff. We actually have two presentations on this, one back from December at our open house that you can watch if this is a, a topic of interest to you um, that kind of lays out what the problems were 
uh, and the potential solutions that we were evaluating at that time. And then the one that we released this week is the one that, that really lays out the specific proposal that we plan to move forward with. And uh, it, it's all focused on the token economics. Um, there is a separate change that we're proposing, and that is to make our proposal system more flexible. Um, during 2017 and, and early 2018, when, when the entire crypto space was going through a giant bubble, uh, we found that this fixed 10% that is currently allocated to the proposal system doesn't necessarily function all that well. Mm -hmm. uh, what we ended up seeing was a lot of that went unused or uh, dubious proposals or proposals that had maybe limited value, an endorsement from a celebrity, say, mm -hmm. uh, got approved on the network and they didn't have any lasting effect, mm -hmm. right? And so you saw this kind of attitude of we better spend it or it's wasted. And I, I think that that created a really unhealthy dynamic. At the other end of the spectrum, back in December of 2019, the price fell as low as uh, $39 on Dash. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, the proposal system was insufficient to even fund basic operations. And we mm -hmm. were really digging into our reserves to be able to f continue operating. And a lot of valuable teams got defunded at that time. And so I think we're trying to create a more flexible system that recognizes that 10% isn't always the perfect allocation and allows the network to flex above or below that number as needed. Mm -hmm. So these are really fundamental changes to our protocol and the way that our protocol functions from an economic standpoint. And we're really excited to see these improvements rolled out. We didn't take it lightly. We spent you know, five, six months researching this and statistically analyzing the behavior on the network to make sure that we've got things right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds like a great proposal. And is this effective immediately or is there an upcoming timeline on when these changes will actually occur in the network if it's approved? So uh, first we have to put a formal proposal to the network for a vote. Um, what we've done is we've presented this initially. We're going to be holding some Q and A's over the next couple of weeks, both uh, you know in a video chat as well as um, you know with uh, the community through AMAs and things like that to make sure that it's well understood. Then we're going to put a what's called a decision proposal to the network, and it's a simple yes no uh, decision on whether or not to implement these things. There'll be separate votes on each because one could be implemented without the other, and vice versa. And so um, uh, we certainly hope they both pass. If they pass, they will be implemented into the pro protocol. Um, one of those changes is far easier to make than the other. And so we'll probably uh, code them in um, as time permits, uh, but we'll, we'll look to move quickly and get those into the protocol as quickly as we can. We're mm -hmm. probably looking at the fall uh, for implementation, assuming that they pass. And this is something that's really unique to Dash is, you know, if you want to get a new feature into uh, Bitcoin or other um, protocols that strictly rely on the miners, getting it through is a monumental task. Um, it requires, a, a, you know, super majority of the network, like 80, 90 percent support rate in order to see those things get implemented. Um, and with our system, we actually just get to vote. And, um, you know, as long as uh, the super majority, meaning like more like, you know, 60% of the votes come mm -hmm. in in favor and 40% against, it's something that we can implement safely. And so the, the voting system is something that is, is that Dash pioneered and has allowed us to do more controversial uh, shifts, um, perhaps, or um, you know, do so in a safer manner. And, mm -hmm. and so as a result, we're able to do these types of innovations without splitting our network in two. Mm -hmm. That's great. And I like that you mentioned one of the goals is being bringing price stability, right? Because a lot of uh, adoption of these digital currencies is coming from, especially with Dash, you know, in South America, a lot of countries that are experiencing hyperinflation, uh, like Venezuela, for example, and there's great uh, 
adoption towards Dash, but even for, and you know, it's a it's very stable in comparison to the Venezuelan Bolivar. But increased stability, I could imagine, would make it even uh, more attractive to use. So that's that's good to know. And you know, we're running out of time, Ryan. But what is the best way for people to learn more about this vote, uh, about the mining and the master nodes, and just getting involved with the Dash community? Well, we will. We have the videos um, of the two presentations. One is from our open house back in December, and uh, one uh, was just here that, this last week. And they're entitled Improving Dash as a Store of Value. And those are accessible on our YouTube channel. It, our YouTube channel is Dash Pay. Um, and to learn more about the project in general, um, the, the place to start is really on our website, dash.org. We've got links there to all the different social media uh, that's available, uh, chat groups, like uh, we've got a couple of chat groups on Discord. We've got a, a link to Reddit and our Reddit uh, channels, uh, YouTube, um, whatever your, your venue of choice is. We've got a great following on Twitter. And just follow the project. And um, those are great ways to kind of hook into what we're doing and, and the changes that we're making. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, we're, we're always looking for uh, uh, ways to expand our users and, and our user base. And, and um, uh, there's a lot of great resources there. Um, uh, one example is our gift card program. You can earn discounts on gift cards if you pay in Dash. Uh, that's at giftcards.dash.org. And so we, we like to bring in people who want to incorporate this into their day-to-day -day life, not just hold it but actually use it and, mm -hmm. um, and use it like it's meant to be used as currency. And so uh, those are the types of resources that you'll find on our webpage. Definitely. And that's very valuable to get those uh, people that are actually using the currency. So I will leave those links down in the description box below for the viewers. Thank you so much for your time, Ryan. I really appreciate it. Uh, all the best moving forward with Dash and let's follow up in the near future. All right. Thank you very much.